This is Rosa Shaw, and I'm here to guide you through the daily activities, events, and the in and outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one with some popcorn bucks, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. Hello, Rosa Shaw here, speaking to you from a small cafe adjacent to the famous Black Sun Bar, giving you the latest on what is happening on the street and what is affecting us. Our world here in the metaverse. On this um, episode, we're going to talk about uh, the right to repair and the movement and the need for such um, protections or the rights for individuals to repair their electronics and why it is such a big hassle or an ordeal for people to be able to uh, do such activities. But before we discuss the right to repair, uh, this article is from the Washington Post. The FCC is stopping nine companies from providing federally subsidized internet to the poor by Brian Fung. Um, the FCC, you know, new administration, um, the thing why it's so key and so important about the FCC, particularly the, the United States when it comes to the governments of the internet, is that it pretty much sets the standard for the world. Uh, currently, right now, uh, the, the U.S. Senate has passed, which will allow um, a bill that which will allow internet providers to sell your data, your browsing history, if it chooses to. Your ISPs can do that. It is currently in the House. Uh, there's efforts right now to uh, contact their legislators out here in the states to prevent that bill from passage because no doubt um, uh, the current president will sign that bill. There's also another thing where there will be an approval of a merger of, I believe it's Time Warner to become Spectrum. Uh, which merger is it? There's a couple of different mergers that are going on, which would uh, be serious hampering of the internet, particularly when it comes to net neutrality. That's something that's being um, pulled back, where those rules are being pulled back, you should say, where all internet traffic is treated equally. Uh, they're allowing for zero rating, where, for example, uh, T Mobile does this, as well as uh, other. Uh, phone service providers were, for example, Spotify. Uh, if you utilize Spotify through T-Mobile, you, it doesn't go against your data cap. So you can stream as much as you want with Spotify or Pandora as one of the media caps. Uh, Netflix, I believe, has a deal with one of the, the um, phone providers where if you stream Netflix, it, it doesn't count against your data cap. So you can pretty much you know, sit there and watch as many movies as you want off of your mobile device and you're not going to, you know, lose anything. Uh, you're not going to go, basically, if you watch maybe like maybe one or two shows, uh, you will already hit your two, two gigabytes, if you do something like that with Netflix. Uh, music takes a little bit longer, but still, uh, by not being able to treat all tra- internet traffic equally, that gives it a significant economic disadvantage for other companies or rising companies, if you will, they're in those areas. And those are the heavy changes that could easily ripple out throughout the world if you you say these type of policies. So this, for example, was something that was created under the previous administration, which would allow for allowing, basically treating the the internet like utilities, like lights, like water, a necessity of life that everyone should have access to. Regulators are telling nine companies that won't, they, they won't be allowed to participate in a federal co- program meant to help them provide affordable internet access to low-income income consumers weeks after those companies have been given the green light. The move announced by Friday by the FCC Chairman Ajit Haye reverses the decision by the Democratic predecessor Tom Wheeler and undercuts the company's ability to provide low-cost internet access for poor Americans. In a statement, I called it an initial decision of form of midnight regulation. These last minute actions, which do not enjoy the support of the majority of the commissioners at the time they were taken, should not bind us going forward, he said. The program known as Lifeline provides registered households with a $9.25 a month credit, which they can be used to buy home internet service. As many as 13 million Americans might be eligible for Lifeline that do not have broadband service at home. The FCC has found roughly 900 service providers providers participate in the Lifeline program. For, K- for KG Incorporated, one of the companies that was initially granted permission to provide services through Lifeline, the news came as a blow. 
I'm most concerned about the children we serve, said KG founder Daniel Neal. We have partnered with school districts, 41 states, and the District of Columbia to provide educational broadband so the poor kids can do their homework. Since becoming the chairman last month, PIE has made the closing the digital divide a central access in this policy agenda. Although the vast majority of Americans have access to the internet service, there remains distant gaps in the U.S. broadband penetration, particularly among seniors, minorities, and the poor. In his first address to FCC mm-hmm. staff, Pai singled out the digital divide as one of the signature issues he hoped to address. But Friday moves cuts against those remarks, according to some consumer advocates who argue the decision will make it harder for low-income Americans to access the web. The most obvious factor I said is that high-speed internet is astronomically expensive for middle class and down to Gene uh, Kilderman, president of the Consumer Advocacy Group for Public Knowledge. So any way of limiting the, life, the lifeline program at this moment in time exacerate the digital divide. It doesn't address it in any positive way. And it just kind of continues on forward. And we will talk about the digital divide, um, why it's necessary for complete penetration, if you will, of the internet throughout all sorts of demographics, both economic, ethnic, um, um, geographic, if you will, how it will better society if people have the ability to connect. Um, as part of the, a bunch of leaks that have happened uh, from Vault 7's weekly leaks, uh, which we will address maybe in a little bit down the road, um, when all that has been fully um, leaked, uh, WikiLeaks is leaking different stuff at different times, um, uh, combined with other previous leaks when it comes to basically knowing that there's all sorts of different vulnerabilities with all sorts of uh, OS systems, both on the phone and desktop. Uh, this article comes from Red and Pi, a firm that helped the FBI break into the San Bernardino iPhone GIS hack and tools leaked online. In case your mind in case you mind back to when the Apple refused to unlock the iPhone F5C for the authorities following the San Bernardino incident last year, the company made the argument that if it created a tool for opening up an encrypted iPhone, then it would create the potential for that tool to fall into the wrong hands and ultimately make iPhone encryption obsolete. The FBI didn't agree with this and went ahead and found someone else to do the hacking, Israel firm uh, Celebrite. And in turn, events had more than a hint of irony to them. Celebrite has now had their own service hacked with most Parts of that iPhone hacking tool now leaked on the internet. A report by Motherboard cites a source who hacked into a remote Celebrite server and stole 900 gigabytes of data, including evidence that the Celebrite did work for countries such as Russia, Turkey, and the UAE. The treasure trove of data also includes a host of files relating to the hacking of the iPhones, according to the publication. So those tools are out, are out online. They have been for a while. Um, both Android and um, Apple have stated that they patched up a lot of the different vulnerabilities that have been leaked by Vault 7, as well as other leaks that have occurred. Um, Windows is working on something. Linux is looking at its stuff. There's some vulnerabilities there, even with Linux. There's certain stuff that has been known and just it hasn't really been fixed. But, you know, it may come to a point where people are going to have to start kind of building their own, where they're no longer... Um, going to an Apple or an Android, they are taking various pieces and, and putting things together. I know that Google has shut down their um, mod phone project, but that might be something that might be back on the line. There's also like the black phone that is out there that is supposed to be, you know, uh, an Android base, but um, everything from the hardware to the software, uh, not only is open source, but it's uh, secure on down the line from the various chips and stuff like that. To were basically based around security and privacy for the individuals who utilize that phone. Um, it may come down to it where people are going to have to start building their own, if you will, or different companies are going to come into the marketplace that are capable of providing the, the privacy and security that people are seeking. Uh, Elon Musk, our other favorite super bond villain, uh, after Peter Thiel, uh, agrees to hold a contest for fan-made Tulsa ads at the urging of a fifth grader. The auto the automaker founder likes a Berea's idea by Tim Nude, which is after off of Ad Week. Elon Musk is well aware that Tesla super fans love to make unauthorized commercials for the brand, given that Tesla doesn't make its own and, and given the power of word of mouth doesn't really need to, but it has taken a fifth grade girl to convince him to actually run a fan made ad. Dear Elon Musk, I'm brief of Mrs. Espa's fifth grade class. She wrote to the Tulsa Federal Letter that her father 
our writer for InsideEVs.com, also posted to Twitter. I have noticed that you do not advertise, but many people make homemade commercials for Telsa, and some of them are very good. They look professional, and they are entertaining. So I think you should run a competition on what, uh, who can make the best homemade Telsa, and the winner will get the, the commercial aired. Within an hour of the Twitter post, uh, posted by her father, Musk, who apparently is as smart as a fifth grader, brightened with an idea. Thank you for your lovely letter. That sounds like a great idea. We'll do it, he wrote. Uh, we've written about a number of fan-made Telsa commercials here at Ad Freak over the years. The best known is a 2014 spot called Modern Spaceship, which is a lovely extraterrestrial them for Everdreams Pictures. A year later, Parachute and director uh, Sam O'Hara made his own gorgeous Telsa spec ad, Fireflies, which was the most, which was also the more stunning as it was completely CGI. Um, more details of the Tesla co contest as they become available. So this is just fascinating. This shows you the power of social media, Twitter, and ad, uh, reaching out to people. The fact that in this day and age you can actually directly speak to people in power through things like Twitter or uh, Facebook, if you will. I think Twitter is a fact, like I stated in. Um, I think it was here on the Metaverse, I stated how it's more of an announcer, like the town choir are crying out, um, allows you to communicate and reach, and reach people, while Facebook's a more, uh, I want to say nuanced, you can have much longer conversations, you will, people are still kind of sometimes shouting at each other on Facebook. Uh, but you still can reach people through social media. I think Snapchat is also, uh, because of the video aspect, is another great way to reach people. You can chat to people, send chat, uh, direct chat messages. I think Instagram, because it has um, more people or more users on it than Snapchat, um, and it has added the, uh, basically copied the whole story feature of Snapchat, um, has a stronger reach when it comes to that. But um, again, the, you know, the world is changing, the way we communicate, the way we interact, and how things can move in a very far more rapid pace than they have in uh, previous years, if you will. So, soon down the line, you will see a contest of uh, fan-made Tessa um, ad advertisements. So, W3C. So, let's talk about what the W3 board is first, before we get into this bit of news. So, the, the W3C, or the World Wide Web, is short name. It's the main international standard organization for the World Wide Web. Uh, founded and currently led by Ted Brantley, the man who invented the World Wide Web and made it open for everyone to utilize. Uh, he did make it a proprietary program. He just open sourced it. And because of that, we have the internet. Uh, the consortium is made up of, me of a member organizations which maintain full-time staff for the purpose of working together in development of standards for the World Wide Web. Um, as of February of this year, it has 432 members. And they go from around the world, from pretty much every country you can think of has um, a body or a membership member that uh, speaks to the worldwide consortium and has some kind of input or at least speaks to um, how the internet in itself is, the standards for the internet is developed. So, on EME and HTML5, um, this is by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, this is the concern in their participation, and it's their blog. So the question which has been debated around the net is whether the W3C should endorse the encrypted media and extension standard, which allows a web page to include encrypted content by connecting an existing underlying digital rights management (ERM) system and the underlying platform. Some people have protested no. But in fact, I decided the actual logical answer is yes. As many people have been so fervent in the demonstrations, I feel I owe it to them to explain my logic. And my hope as, is as they, there are many things which need to be protested, investigated, and followed up in this world, that the energy which has been uh, expended on protests in the EME could be rechanneled at uh, other things which they really need, which really need it. Other things that have argued along the way, there have always been many things I have agreed with. And to understand the disagreement, we need to focus on the actual question whether the W3C should recommend EME. The reason for recommending EME is that by doing so, we lead the industry who developed it in the first place to form a simple, easy way of putting encrypted content online so there will be 
and inter interoperable between browsers. This makes it easier for web developers and also for users. People like to watch Netflix to take one example. So people, people spend a lot of time on the web and like to be able to embed Netflix co content in their own web pages. They like to be able to link to it. They like to be able to have discussions where they express what they think about the content or their comments in the content can be also linked to. Um, news just came out uh, earlier this week that um, if you're a Linux user like myself, you can now watch uh, Netflix on Linux, either through Firefox or Chrome and or um, Chrome. Could they put the NAS out because of uh, the support of EMU by uh, Mozilla, the creators of Firefox. Could they put content on the web without DRM? Well, yes. The, for a huge amount of video content is on the web without DRM. It's only the big expensive movies where, where they put content on the web on that makes it too easy for people to copy. In the reality, the utopia world of people voluntarily and paying full price for content does not work. Others argue that the whole copyright system should be dismantled and they can do that in legislators and campaign to change the treaties which would be a long struggle, and meanwhile we do have copyright. So yeah, this goes all back, back to basically, at this point, extremely antiquated system, the copyright system, which is trying to push itself into the 21st century, while the 21st century is just like trying so, so hard to try to ignore copyright and, and kick it to the curb, or ignore it but it just keeps screaming and screaming and pounding the table and saying that it's there and here and you can't ignore it like a like a child basically like a five-year-old child that if you're in a restaurant or in uh, any type of play, public space where they're just out of control and a lot of times you know it, you know children are children and they, they can't help being children and it has really much to do with um maybe you have to let them cry it out but they have some legitimate concerns when it comes to copyright but other times you got to kind of wrangle them and, and and say hey you're going too far here and that's not necessarily the case that's going on any longer <clears throat> well anyways given a DRM is a thing when a company decides to distribute content they want to protect they have many choices and this is a point to remember if the W3C did not recommend EME, then the browser vendors would make it outside W3C. If EME did not exist, vendors should just create new JavaScript-based versions. And without using the web at all, it's so easy to vent, one, to vent one's viewers to switch to view the content on a proprietary app. And if the closed platforms prohibit DRM and the apps, then the large content providers would simply distribute their own set bo top boxes and game consoles are the only way to watch their stuff. If the director of the custodian made a decree that would, there would be no more DRM, in fact, nothing would change because the W3C does not have any power to forbid anything. The W3C is not the U.S. Congress or the, or the WIPO or a court. It would perhaps have shortened the debate, but we would have been distracted from the important things which need thought and action on other issues. Well, could the W3C make a stand just because DRM? a bad thing for users could just refuse to work on DRM and push back whatever they could on it? Well, that would again not have any effect because the W3C is not a court or an enforcement agency. The W3C is a place for people to talk and forge consensus over the greater new technology of the web. Yes, there's an argument made that in, that in any case, the W3C should just stand up against DRM. But we, like Kentu, <laughs> understand our power is limited. But importantly, there are reasons why pushing people away from the web is a bad idea. It's better for users for the DRM to, do, to be done through EME than other ways. One, when the content is, a, is in a web page, it's part of the web. Two, the EME system can't sandbox the DRM code to limit damage it can do to the user system. Three, the EME system can sandbox the DRM code to limit the damage it can do to the user's privacy. And there is a... Um, if you click on the, within the show notes, there is a um, nice little chart out for you to understand what's going on. As mentioned above, when the providers distribute a movie, they have lots of options. They have different advantages and disadvantages. An important issue here is how much the publisher gets to learn about the user. If they sell a DVD or Blu-ray disc, they never get to know whether the user watches it. From the user's point of view, they can watch each bit of it as many times as they like without feeling they're being watched. 
If they put it on the web using EME, they will get to record that the user unlocked the movie. The browser through in the EME system can limit the amount of access the DRM code has and can permit it from phoning home with more details. The web page may also monitor the report on the user if it can be detected and monitored as the code is not part of the EMIM block. If they put it on an app in a closed system like an iPhone, then they get to do to make whatever DRM, DRM they like. They also get to watch exactly how and where the user watches which bits of the movie if they can persuade the user to allow them other access, such as such the user's calendar, they can completely profile the user and correlate this with their movie watching habits. If they distribute it using an app on an open system like an Android or a Mac OS X, then they can get the same feedback as an iPhone app. However, and as the app, as the OS is not a lockdown system, the app may be able to further abuse the user by possibly exfiltrating further information, and also like in the Sony rootkit case, install spyware on the system. If they distribute it with their own closed system like a game console, console or set-top box, then the user is protected from spying on the computer. The publisher has complete control of the information which is sent back, and the user can play and pause and so on. The user has no way, though, to have this as a part of their connected web life. There are no links in or out. So in summary, it is important to support EME as a providing relatively safe online environment in which to watch a movie, as well as the most convenient and one which makes it part of the interconnected dis discourse of humanity. I should mention the extent in which the sandboxing of the DRM code protects the user is not defined by the EME spec at all, although current implications at least Firefox and Chrome do sandbox the DRM. Spread to other media. Don't worry that, that having put movies on the web, then the content providers will want to switch also to use it for other media such as music and books. For music, I don't think so, because we've seen industry move consciously from DRM, DRM based model to an unencrypted model, where often the buyer's email address may be put in a watermark, but there is no DRM. For books, yes, it could be a problem, because there's been a large number of closed, non-web devices which people are used to, and for which the publishers are used to using DRM. For many, the physical devices have been replaced by apps, including DRM, and a general purpose device like closed phones or open computers. We can hope that the industry is moving to a web model, also give, give up DRM, but it isn't clear. We have talked about the advantages of different ways of using DRM in streaming movies. Now let us discuss some of the problems of DRM systems in general. Problems with the DRM. Much of the web post is W3C's technical perspective on EMM, which I provide weary, provide wearing my director's hat, but in the following about DRM and the DMCA, that since this is a policy issue, I'm expressing my personal opinions. Problems for users. There are many issues with the DRM. From the user's point of view, there have been much documented elsewhere. Here, let me list these. Fair use of the material is not possible, such as expecting from, from commentary, educational purposes, and so on. The preventing remixing of der derivative works. The user cannot take a backup copy. Having a DRM blob at one's computer is a security threat, and that it can attack the machine. DRM systems are generally frustrating for users, and some of this can be confounded by things like attempts to reuse code and license so the user can only access when they are in a particular country, confusion between buying and renting something for a fixed term, and issues when contact suppliers, suppliers cease to exist and all bought things become inaccessible. Despite these issues, users continue to buy DMR protected content. Problem for developer. DRM prevents independent developers from building different playback systems that interact with, it, with the video screen. For example, to add accessibility features such as speeding up or slowing down playback. But yeah, that is a very big issue, particularly when watching shows when you're trying to like move ahead because you either seen something or you're trying to skip past um, maybe your you know like scary movies, the scary part, or you're trying to get to the good stuff or you, for whatever reason um, the play the play forward or playback issue um, is key, especially for example in like dialogue. Or so, like mumblecore, where you, you might even have the volume like way up so you can hear something, but you still have to play it back to in order to be able to fully understand a conversation. And it it gets very difficult. Where versus a DVD, you can get pretty precise, but on streaming, not so much. Problems for prosperity. There's possibility that we'll end up in decades' time with no usable record record of these movies because either they're they are so encrypted or because people don't bother keeping copies of them at the time because the copies would have been useless to them. One of my favorite suggestions is that anyone copywriting a movie and distributing an encrypted 
in any way must dis dispose of the uncrypted copy of the set of copyrighted libraries, which would include the British Library, the Library of Congress, and the Internet Archives. Problems with the law. Much of the pushback against EMM has been based on the pushback against DRM, which has been based on some specific important problems of certain laws. The laws must discuss in the U.S. Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or the DMCA, other laws that exist in other countries which, to a greater or lesser extent, resemble the DMCA. See again, the U.S. setting, setting the precedent. Some of these have been brought up in the discussion, but we do not have the exhaustive list or analysis of them. It's worth noting that the U.S. has spent a lot of energy using the various bilateral and multilateral agreements to persuade other countries into adopting laws like the DMCA. I do not go into the laws in other countries here. I do point out, though, that this cannot be dismissed as a U.S. only problem. That said, let's go into the DMCA in more detail. Whatever else you would like to change about the copyright system as a whole, there are particular parts of the DMCA, specifically Section 1201, which put innocent security researchers at risk of dire punishment if they are deemed to have thrown light on any DRM system. There is an attempt at one point in the W3C process to refuse to bring the EMA spec forward until all the working group participants would agree to identify security researchers under this, this section. To cut a very long story short, the attempt failed and historians may point to a lack of leverage the EMA spec had to be used in this way and the difference between the set of companies in the working group and the set of companies which likely to sue over the DMCA, among other reasons. Security researchers. There is currently, in 2017 a related effort at the W3C to encourage companies to set up bug bounty programs to the extent that at least they, they guaranteed immunity from prosecution to security researchers who find and report bugs in their system. While the W3C can encourage this, it can only provide guidelines and cannot change the law. I encourage those who think this is important to help find a common set of best practice guidelines which companies will agree to. A first draft of some guidelines was announced. Please help make them make the effort and acceptable and get your company to adopt them. Obviously, a more logical thing would, would be to change the law, but the technical community seems to have been resigned to not being able to positive effect on the U.S. legislative system due to the well-documented problems with that system. This is something where public pressure could perhaps be beneficial on the companies to agree in on adopting protection. Not to mention changing the root cause in the DMCA. The W3C would like to hear, by the way, of an example of security researchers having this sort of problem so that we can all follow this. The future web. The web has to be universal to function at all. It has to be capable of holding crazy ideas of the moment, but also the well-polished ideas of the century. It must be able to handle any language and culture. It must be able to include information of all types of media and many genres, including that universally is that it must be able to support free stuff and for paid stuff as they are all part of this world. That means that it's for the good for the web to be able to include movies and so for that it better, it's better for HTML5 to have EME than not to have it. T. Tim Beale. There, you know, that, like he's stated in his personal opinions, there's problems with DRM, there's problems with the, the EME system in itself, but you there has to be some kind of consensus. You have to allow some of this. And you don't have to use EME. You don't have to use HTML5. You can use a completely different type of system and you can go about breaking things and changing things and fixing things for yourself. And companies can do their own type of thing. But by having this type of standards and some consensus, there can be some kind of workaround. And really what it has to do, it has to do with uh, uh, legislation and changing it. Changing copyright law, changing you know, patent law, changing a lot of things with the legislative body that will allow um, for a more free and universal acceptance of information, if you will. And the connection of the, onto the internet. Um, in long term, it would be very much be um, helpful for all, if you will. So the right to repair um, is an increasing and ever growing to allow for people to be able to repair their electronic devices. And you're thinking to yourself, well, why is that a right? Why do people need to fight for the ability to repair their electronics? Well, it all comes back down to the Digital Millennium Copy Act, which protects um, the software licenses. In fact, um, what it is allowed to do for software licenses allows for the DRM management 
and technical uh, protection measures, the TPMs, which are designed to prevent unauthorized copying. And what has happened is um, <clears throat> your license, like your physical device that you purchase, like your iPhone and your uh, computer, the actual hardware itself um, you own, but all the software, the proprietary information, like your iTunes, for example, or um, the actual you know, visit, um, dialing mechanism for you to dial out is all owned by Apple and your license and that software. And so there's these end user agreements that are very extremely restrictive where you cannot actually technically uh, resell your your Apple or your Apple iPhone or Android phone or a lot of uh, devices or you know, Xbox or anything like that because all these companies want to protect those licenses. Uh, you know, and, and because of that, you having some serious hurdles when it comes to reuse cases, particularly when it comes to electronic devices, repairing electronic devices, um, and it's hampering all sorts of industries because they need, they have to go back to the manufacturer or pay like a resorbent and license fees to work with um, license um, contractors licensed by the um, owners of the particular software program to be able to fix a device. And because of that, it's really hampering the certain types of growth. One of the reasons why a lot of these security vulnerabilities and bugs haven't been found in a lot of these operating systems is because they're proprietary. And without a bug bounty to cover people, even though people still hack and go into these types of systems, there's not enough people who are willing to do it because they can easily be held liable, um, be sued by these licensing companies for exposing the bug. And this happened in a number of different cases, but also face prison sentences, very lengthy prison sentences for um, basically breaking into these uh, licensed proprietary software programs to find out how they work. I mean, you can't even get a lot of particular diagnostic manuals on how certain type of software programs work. Um, it's either very difficult um, to obtain, and more importantly, when people try to break these things down, a lot of times they are also being sued for doing so. And there's a number of different court cases that are going through the court systems, and we'll talk about one of them. But there is a significant movement. There's efforts on the legislative level to allow people to be able to repair the electronic devices. Just think of all the waste that is happening because, um, you know, you drop your phone. I'm just using the phone as an example because it's the most widely used electronic devices that people have. You drop your phone, you crack uh, the screen. Well, maybe it's not too bad of a crack, so you can still work with it. But you drop it again, and it gets more cracked, and then it's, it's very hard to, you know, uh, use your finger to move up and down. And because you no longer have hardware keys to uh, navigate on your phone, you're going to have to go and get it replaced. So you go to the, the, the store to get it replaced, and it's like a couple, you know, it's half the price of the phone to already get it replaced, even though you're on contract. When in fact the actual replacing of the screen, if you will, is like you can there's kits you can get off of Amazon and um, actual uh, especially for Apple, there's a lot of because iPhone is very popular. You can switch out the screens and do it yourself, or you can go to the person that does it for you. Well, these repair places technically, uh, because the the screen and the hardware is um, you own that, you can get that done. But there has been some kind of battles with that when it comes to that in and of itself, uh, fixing your screen. But because for most people, it's much easier for them to uh, go to the store and replace it, you have all this kind of electronic waste. Um, you're not having a lot of reuse. Um, a lot of computers, for example, like there's certain components within it that can be used to um, scrap down and get like the gold and the usable parts, if you will. But actually being able to repair and, and extend the life of a particular electronic device um, is hard to do because of the, the licenses attached to certain types of programs and what happens when a company goes out of business, uh, things of that nature. In fact, um, there's a lot of cases like, for example, when a person dies when it comes to their um, Facebook account, you know, technically you don't own your Facebook account. Facebook owns your account. You're just kind of licensing it. And if you're not an actual authorized user, the actual individual, when you die, 
you basically give up your right to that Facebook account. And a lot of people have issues with that. Same thing with emails, especially with free emails and stuff, and try to get into these different accounts. There's issues with, you know, when somebody dies and getting into a person's iPhone, you know, contacting Apple and trying to figure out how to get into that person's uh, phone so they can access the information. Um, there could be easy workarounds, if you will, if that information was open source and people could see the code and they would be able to access that. But then again, you know, the issue about privacy, you know, once a, a door is found or a way to unlock it, that anyone can unlock the phone at any time. Um, but the point of the matter is people, you don't really technically own the software program. Like, for example, if, you know, this has happened with iTunes, um, music accounts, uh, mysteriously people, you know, they upload their entire, you know, music catalog on, into their iTunes account. So, and they actually may even get rid of some of their physical discs. And then for some reason, one update later, their entire catalog is right back at their iTunes account because of some kind of software glitch within Apple. Now there was a case somewhere in the period in the early aughts where Apple actually deliberately did this because it wasn't um, their actual music, but do you know they could, I guess you can say, um, properly identify the, the MP3 files or whatever, so they got rid of them. Um, but in this case, in some recent cases, it's just you know that there's some weird glitch that has wiped out entire people's entire music catalogs even music that these people created and, and made of their own. And so there's all sorts of kind of issues and things of that nature when it comes to these proprietary licenses and how fixing it and how to undo stuff and how to protect your information. And most importantly, maybe to repair that glitch. Imagine if you could actually, you know, because Apple wasn't acknowledging the glitch, but you can go into the software, find out what that glitch is and fix it and prevent something like that from happening to your particular usage of the program. Um, all the time you see, you know, modifying um, games. Mod games are very big, particularly for things like Minecraft and you know, Fallout. Well, some game systems don't particularly like mods, and they won't allow authorized mods. So you have all these unauthorized mods that happen, where people add things like, you know, Thomas the Train, game, train Engine can come into GT5 and you can battle it, or... You could be such and such character and things of that nature. And while well, mods are now um, kind of getting more accepted on the Xbox console, you have to be like, you know, if you, basically, if you create a mod, you have to give up your right to really, if you want it to be able to be played and be playable on an Xbox One. When it comes to the PC Master Race, it's completely different. But even in that, it's getting more and more difficult for mods to be as widely distributed as they once were. You can still get a lot. A lot of them off of Steam and different sites, but you know these gaming companies are cracking down hard on these things because they want to protect their proprietary game, you know, licenses. But also, they want to you know make money off the mods. They want to be the ones that only create the mods or authorize or allow for usage of mods, and they won't allow for um, a fair use or remix of, of their material. And so. I know this it sounds a little bit con con convoluted, but again, it comes back to the point because of the, the Digital Millennial Copyright Act and the DRM protections and the TPM protections are, are attached to these licenses. And just the way the nature of the copyright system is, and the fact that it's pretty much antiquated, again, it's like the 25th, 20th century um, spoiled child that's here in the 21st century. Just demanding attention and acknowledgement and doesn't want to conform or be part of the current system. There, there's no way to change. It's going to take a significant amount of effort on the legislative level to change copyright law, to change um, the nature of these type of licenses. For example, I think um, it used to be at least here in the States, it used to be that after a short period of time, copyright patents would, ex you know, expire. And when that happened, it, was, it would go to the public domain. It was the interest of all, if you will, for knowledge to enter, enter into the public domain. It used to be a very short, brief period of time that something would be copyrighted. Like within the lifetime of the person.
person, you know, you see like 14 years or 20 years, and this concept kept getting expanded to the point where your heirs can now have control of your copyright to almost like 70 years after the death of the individual. So you can have works of material, um, for example, because people are living longer and longer and longer, they could not, you know, the copyright is not going to expire to almost a century to maybe a century and a half after the creation. And so you're never going to see a uh, BBC version of Spider-Man like you see with Sherlock. You know, Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain. You're never going to see a, um, you, know, it's a, you know, a BBC version of Superman, that take on the whole life of Superman, you know, going to the superhero things, or maybe a BBC version of Star Wars. All because the, the copyright of that is not going to expire anytime soon. So uh, this article about a particular case that will be pretty significant if it allows for the ability for people to, you know, repair, to change things. Um, this comes from The Consumerist, written by Kate Cox. Why should you care about the Supreme Court case on the toner cartridges? The corporate squabble over print toner cartridges doesn't sound particularly glamorous, and the phrase patent exhaustion is probably already causing your eyes to glaze over. However, these otherwise boring topics are the crux of the Supreme Court case that will answer a question with far reaching impact for all consumers. Can a company that sold you something use this patent on that product to control how you choose to use it after you buy it? Case in question is Impression Products Incorporated versus Mark Lexmark International Incorporated came before the nation's highest court on Tuesday. As with many SCOTUS disputes, uh, Lexmark is a devil in the details case that could have wide ranging implications for basically everyone who ever buys anything and so all of us. And here's the background. Lexmark makes printers. Printers need toner in order to print, and Lexmark also happens to sell toner. Then there's Impression Products, a third-party company makes and refills toner cartridges for use in printers, including Lexmark. Lexmark, however, didn't want that. If you use a third-party toner cartridge, that money that Lexmark doesn't make, so it's sued, which brings us to the legal chain that ended up at the Supreme Court. So here's the thing, and this is, this is sometimes a downside of capitalism, this adverse nature that you're supposed to have a continuous money flow, if you will. Once a product has been sold, it has always been the case since the beginning of time. Once you sell something and give it to another person, it is theirs to have and to own. And what they do after with that is their business. But now companies want to, because of technology, and it's much easier, if you will, for them to be able to garner access and gain information. They want to control that product no matter what. From that first buy to that second buy to that third buy, whether you resell it, reuse it, whatever you do with it, they want absolute complete control. They want money, money, money coming in. Just think about, you know, going to the back in the day when you used to turn in your CDs or even GameStop and you used to turn in your um, your games and get either points at GameStop or money directly by. You know, those game makers only got that first purchase money. Well, GameStop will take that game. Um, make sure it's still playable, and then turn around and resell it. And GameStop now gets that money, and those gamers, the game makers don't, and they don't really like that. That's why they're pushing digital downloads so hard. And it's crazy because you don't own the digital download. Uh, you don't. It's, it's licensed, so you can't give it to someone. You can't give it to somebody, even though there is, you know, Xbox talks about gifting and sharing and stuff like that. But in in general, you really in essence you don't own you know fallout 3 if you download it onto your computer you might own the hard disk and obviously the upload uh, onto an xbox one or xbox 360 whatever uh, but you you don't actually truly own that digital download anyways <clears throat> continuing on printmakers are notoriously finicky about cartridges because they will all that's where all the money is companies like canon hp and Lent, Lexmark or aren't really making their millions from the $75 you spend on a printer. The real cash comes over the long term when you have to keep spending $30 on a name brand ink cartridge once or twice every year that follows. Um, 
talk to you a little bit more than that because they actually, what they encourage you to do is normally pull them up to the top. And then there's a whole software thing about the whole encourages that I think Canon got an issue with when they went and allowed the third party encourages into their, into their printers. And there's a whole thing. It's a very big, big scam. And I, I think it needs to be really seriously cleaned up. But anyways, in an effort to keep others from getting a piece of the sweet toner revenue, Lexmark turned to his patents. The company began selling print cartridges with notice in the package forbidding reuse or transfer to third parties. Then when a third party like Impression came around reselling or recycling the cartridge, Lexmark would accuse him of patent infringement. So far, the carts, carts have sided with Lexmark, using the Impression was using Lexmark's patent technology in an unauthorized way. The Supreme Court is Impression's last avenue of appeal. What is the legal argument? When inventors make things, not just the idea of things, but the actual things, they secure patents on them so that for a time, nobody else can make the same thing in the same way. So far, so good. As a concept, at least, patent law is fairly straightforward, even if the details get maddeningly complex. But patents have limits, and legally speaking, those limits basically take hold when you sell the thing you made. That's a legal concept known as exhaustion. When the consumers have bought a thing, it's yours and you to own it, and you can do whatever you want, even if someone else holds a patent on it. So your toothbrush has a special tooth cleaning patent. You can still use it to scrub tile grout if you want to because the patent holder has exhausted their ability to control control one once the toothbrush is yours. They can say, oh, please don't use this on anything but teeth, but you're free to ignore them if you see fit. Perhaps your sense this is getting a little bit more complicated in the digital era, though, where you don't own things like movies, music, or even the software on your phone. Rather, it's being licensed, which means companies can go to all kinds of links to keep control of how, when, and where you use the things you bought long after you bought them. Where some kind of digital rights management, ma <coughs> management DRM, was once a stand standard only for video games and movies, you now can find out everything from copy to cars and a whole lot of in between, including print cartridges. For example, those single cup usage copy makers, those are DRM as well. And they get you know, those companies get really upset when you buy uh, third party usage and they try to block that, but there's, you know, there's ways around that, there's hacks around it, if you will. The question before the Supreme Court that then isn't one of can Lexmark patent this because Lexmark can and has. The question is whether can patent exhaustion still be a thing, or does the original manufacturer get to keep having the final say in what you and others do with the product? What's happening in the court? The Supreme Court ruling is still likely months away, but the transcripts of this week's oral arguments can tell us quite a bit about the way the justices may be leaning. The attorneys for both sides, Impression and Lexmark, each point to several previous rulings on patent law to support their own perspective on why the law does or does not support patent rights exhaustion. The problem faced by either side is that most recent cases dealing with exhaustion applies to copyright law and not patent law. The lay of the consumer is that they may seem like a minor distinction, but copyright and patent are two very different beasts, legally speaking. Justice Anthony Kennedy, for his part, seems as surprised as attorneys that the law apparently hasn't handled this already. Are there other examples of really important rulings that have not been codified? Kennedy asked early in session. Why hasn't this been codified? For whatever reason, though, it hasn't, and the court is now dealing with 2017 technology and a 1952 law whose authors can then guess that patent rights will be used to restrict what a consumer can do with a product after it is being purchased. Meanwhile, Chief Justice Roberts, along with Chief Stephen, Chief Stephen Beyer and Samuel Alito, helped, kept wanting to probe the question of why patent law was even necessary for this sort of thing, as SCOTUS blog explains. Each of the three asked some kind of, some kind of question and raised some argument why, whether or wondering why. Lexmark couldn't just restrict the use of his item with ordinary contract agreements instead of patents. In the end, though, the justices didn't say very much that indicated a particularly strong position one way or the other. <coughs> As Scotus Boggs analysts put it, the justices are well aware of the major imp implications here and don't see any obvious way to avoid doing something that will have real economic consequences. Rather, it seems that they're going to have to decide if these kinds of restrictions will or not remain a product of the 21st century's innovation policy. And that is indeed a key question. Basically, everyone with a stake in technology, copyright, software, DRM, privacy, or any other 21st century concern has filed briefs supporting one of the two underlying arguments in this case. This includes IVC groups, industry trade groups, and businesses spanning everything from Costco to Intel. After all, an entire business model and a whole lot of consumer rights are at stake. So, 
if the court decide on the part of repression, it means that third party people can go about and basically with patents, not copyright, but with patents, you still have the exhaustion rule going on here. Like no matter how, whatever a company may add on, they can't control what happens to the product once it's been sold. Uh, this could also be applicable to copyright, and I think that's why a lot of people are concerned, because it still has to do with DRM, digital rights, and, and these protections that are being put in place here. Um, this could have long-term serious economic impl implications here. And so this will eventually be decided by the courts. And it remains to be seen. Currently right now, um, the, the court is eight. So four to four. Uh, the new Supreme Court Justice is um, not on there. And since he hasn't heard the case, um, I'm pretty much sure he's not going to be part of any of this year's sessions or any decisions of this session. But most likely, you know, next year, whatever rounds of cases that come up. Um, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, this is a very important case, if you will. And it all has to do with the concept of the right to repair. So, <coughs> Motherboard had this really great article in the beginning of the year about the right to repair movement is being led by farmers. Uh, farmers are pushing back against legislation that prevents them from fixing their own equipment. If successful, it will be a huge victory for consumers. A major national group has adopted a policy to fight for the right to repair electronics, but not be the one you expect, farmers. The right to repair movement is an effort to loosen laws so allow consumers to be able to fix technology without sending it back to the original manufacturer. Right now, replacement parts and diagnostic tools are carefully guarded by the manufacturer, and right to repair supporters believe that it should be able to be available to the public. The effort has largely been driven by consumer tech sector, like people want to be able to fix their iPhones instead of buying a new one. But the lack of access to repair materials has greatly impacted farmers, too. Modern farming equipment is high-tech and includes onboard computers, but the majority of the farming equipment manufacturers refuse to allow access to the software, claiming it's proprietary information. That means farmers are stuck waiting for a John Deere technician to swap a tiny sensor when it misfires and shuts down the entire tractor. They'd rather just fix it themselves, or at the very least, take it to someone locally who can do that job. But right now, that's not possible. Uh, John Deere being exactly as Apple is being in a wholly different market, they're selling equipment and they're not allowing anybody to fix it except them, says uh, Gay Gordon Byer, an executive director of Repair.org, a lobbying group that pushes for the right to repair legislation. It's been particularly frustrating for farmers who have a legacy for fixing and maintaining their own equipment. It can cause havoc during busy season like harvest, and if the machine goes down, the farmer has to wait days. For repair it means thousands of dollars in lost revenue, but now the farmers are fighting back. The American Farmer Bureau Federation, Federation nonprofit that uses grassroots input to lobby for better agricultural legislation across the country. It's the largest farmer organization in the country, with affiliates in all 50 states and Puerto Rico, and it is just through its right behind the right to repair movement by adopting a new policy specifically addressing the farmer's right to fix his or her own damn tractor. <coughs> The Farming Bureau is pushing to amend the Digital Millennial Copyright Act, behind which companies like Apple and John Deere hide, to require manufacturers to provide access to the same agricultural equipment's diagnostic and repair information made available to the manufacturer's dealer. John Deere and other manufacturers have opposed the right to repair movement, saying they allow too much access to the software to make the machinery less effective or less safe. Uh, John Deere makes print and digital versions of our operational, diagnostic, and technical repair manuals available to the public. The company wrote in a statement to Motherboard, the embedded code within the controllers and processors on our equipment is designed so that our machines operate as intended in a safe, reliable manner and meet all corporate safety emission regulations. Some state legislations have considered bills that would open up the right to repair for farmers specifically, while others have looked at a more broad approach that would cover all electronics from combines to laptops. The Farming Bureau has found that the issue to be of a high enough importance to its members that it's taken it to the federal level. So with this particular big organization, and considering how strong a reach this particular, in fact, uh, organization, I would imagine that within this year, we'll see some initial federal bills being put in place that will address the issue of the right to repair. It may end up being narrowed because both lobbies, you know, those against the right to repair 
and the farmer farmers bureau are going to fight it out. It might be just the farmers have the right to repair it, but this will begin pretty much be the beginning and the end, if you will, for the right to repair. Because the farmers get to repair their their equipment. What about medical technicians for hospitals when their MR machine goes down? When their um, you know the heart monitor goes down? Those type of things. It's going to get broadened and broadened out. And eventually, I think there will, I would say within the next three years, I would say, uh, because a lot of this is, in fact, um, gaining momentum, you will, you're you going to see, uh, I think, an amendment to the Digital uh, Rights Act, where it will allow people to have the legal right to repair their electronics. Now, they may not be able to actually own their product with the first sale doctrine, but they will be able to repair the software. I guess one fight at a time, if you will. So while this is currently, you know, this case is currently going through the court system, um, there is some legislative effort, and there is occurring in five states, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, Minnesota, and China, Massachusetts, and New York. All of them have strong farming communities, so no doubt the, uh, the farmers are working within the legislative body there. But two of these states uh, are states that when they... S- to change our legislation, they, they, they kind of signal to the rest of the country. Um, New York being one of the biggest, um, it's basically like New York, California, and Texas, Florida, the, the, these big four states, particularly Texas, California, New York more so, those three states, whenever they make any kind of legislative action or any changes, it kind of signals to the rest of the, uh, the country as other legislative bodies take a look at that legislation and see if it fits within their, you know, their particular framework. Kansas is another one. It's not as loud as you should in say the bigger states of New York, California, Florida, and Texas, but when it does make legis- legislative changes, it does signal at least very strongly within the Midwest and the South uh, particular changes within their legislative body, if you will. So, this article comes from Engate. It uh, was written by uh, Roberto Baldwin. Uh, anyone with a cracked iPhone screen knows what a pain it is to go through your Apple to get it repaired. You have to make a Genius Bar appointment, which may or may not still require you to wait around for a service technician. Then it could be hours before you get your precious, uh, precious back into your possessions, or you can use one of the repair kiosks found in near, nearly every mall in the United States to be back in business in about 45 minutes. The problem is that the kiosks at other repair shops like it might be running afoul of the wall. Apple doesn't have an authorized repair model for its iOS devices. The iPhone maker isn't alone in this. Other electronic manufacturers only offer repairs via their own stores or workshops. That means individuals and small companies don't have access to official parts or manuals. So they either have to scavenge what they need from broken devices or purchase them from great markets, and that's how they get into trouble using counterfeit parts. To keep small businesses out of trouble and allow end users the opportunity to actually fix things, they buy. Uh, motherboard reports that five states, which I already listed, have introduced right to repair bills. It would give shops the ability to buy the parts they need and get access to official manuals from manufacturers, and it's not just tiny computers you put in your pocket. The bill would also would affect large appliances and tractors. So the farmers, you know, really working on this. So while most of us won't be ripping apart electronics on our own anytime, so these bills will make it easier to get our devices fixed by a third party vendor, even the kiosk firms. So this is why it's very important when we, t- when we kind of open with the in the news with the DRM, uh, digital um, rights management, and what the the W3C did with EMEME, and we talked about how there's a court case going on. We now have legislative bodies. There are organizations out there that are about um, the right to repair. I have a link in the art- article notes, uh, show notes, I should say, about that, particularly. Um, the Electronic Freedom Foundation is very big on the right to repair, um, one of the strongest vo- vocalists for that. But basically what it comes down to is just a matter of control, whether or not we're allowed or allow corporate control of every single aspect of a person's existence, if you think about it. If you think about cars, you think about the computers that we use, the, all the electronic devices, everything is going digital. And so how much control are we really 
to succeed to corporate interests and for convenience. Um, or are we going to take back some of that so we can have privacy and control of our own and do whatever we wish or want with our products? You know, if you think about it, you know, our grandparents or even our parents really didn't have to deal with these particular issues. When they wanted to fix something, all they had to do was go into the drawer, pick, pick, get a screwdriver, and make sure everything's not plugged in, and repair it themselves. Well, that may not be a right that we can currently exercise at this time. And if we don't fight for it now, it might not be a right that we not only able, we might be able to exercise, but our children and grandchildren will not be able to exercise the right to go into you know a drawer and pick out the right tool for the job. So that's it for the main body of the episode. On to a couple other things I think of interest. So here's a neat idea. This comes from the Free Software Foundation. Free phone operating system by Georgia Young. Smartphones are the most widely used form of personal computer today. Thus, the need for a full free phone operating system is crucial to the proliferation of software freedom. Replicant is a full free Android distributed support by the FSF who is working together for free software phone. It's the first mobile operating system OS to run without relying on proprietary system code. Ways to help. Use Replicant and become part of the project community by using its forums contributing to his wiki and submitting any bugs you discover. Please donate via the SSF Replicant's fiscal sponsor to help the project grow by supporting more devices and advancing to Replicant 6.0. So there'll be a link to the show notes to not only to this particular project uh, but to the SFS um, uh, article. And again, this is very important with the open source software and free software. It allows for the distribution of information allows for greater security for individuals. Most importantly, you, you know, you, there are not going to be any back doors or bugs or anything that's going to be uh, lying in the system, if you will, to be exploited by either hackers, malicious actors, or government bodies and agencies. Also in the show notes, I have a very detailed how to opt out privacy. Um, it's a way for you to opt out the, all the data brokers out there, particularly since we've uh, talked about Peter Thiel and his program with his company, Pantera, how the ability for individuals to be not monitored, if you will, or have their data collected, there's ways to opt out of all that information. You have that right to do that. And, um, and there's a link in the show notes here that goes step by step on how you can go about securing your information privacy, if you will, and opting out on all these data brokers. Uh, they don't make it easy, so you may have to put a lot of time and effort to it, but once it's done, you you can have these rest assured that your information is not so widely distributed out there. And then this last bit comes from the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation. Project of the day is Detroit Community Technology Project. Access to affordable smartphones has distributed the extravagant regimes of multinationals and oligarchs in many nations. Connected to the world and to each, each other, ordinary people can create their own production and exchange system. But technology can intimidate people who are unaccustomed to it, especially when they grow up without access. Uh, digital justice aims to provide access to the, to the digital sphere for those without it. With some support from government and local anchor institutions, ordinary citizens can self-organize and address local needs. The, G, the Detroit Community Technology Project fills its role in an impoverished community. The post features three of their endeavors. A discotheque, which is sort of discovering technology, is a model for a community-based and community-organized multimedia drop-in workshop there. At a discotheque, participants learn more about the impact and possibility of technology in their community and take part in fun, interactive, and media-based workshops. A discipline utilizes the unique skills and expertise from each community and morphs to adapt to changing needs. Discotheques are constantly evolving and there are infinite ways of holding you. Uh, the DGC discotheques have integrated the following core concepts, internet, computers, plus electronics, policy, and community resources. The Detroit Community Technology Project is decided to present the Teaching Community Technology Handbook. This 100-page handbook will take you through the history of the popular education while offering a step-by-step -step guide to developing community-rooted technology workshops and curriculum. Um, and it continues on. Um, it's just a great little project of what they're trying to do to help uh, individuals you know, realize their full potential. 
in areas that there's not necessarily the, the greatest access to the internet and digital information. So there's a link in the show notes uh, more about the project and how you can help support either financially or participating, uh, whether it be if you're in the Detroit area or similar projects that I mentioned. Now on to the manifesto. This manifesto comes from iFixit, one of the um, mobile uh, phone companies out there that repair um, mobile devices, particularly iPhones. Uh, it's called Repair, repair Manifesto. Self-Repair Manifesto. Behold this truth to be self-evident. Repair is, re is better than recycling. Making our things last longer is both more efficient and more cost-effective than mining them for raw materials. Repair saves the planet. Earth has limited resources and we can't run a linear manufacturing process forever. The best way to be efficient is to reuse what we already have. Repair saves your money. Fixing things is often free and usually cheaper than replacing them. Doing the repair yourself saves serious dough. Repair teaches engineering. The best way to find out how something works is to take it apart. If you can't fix it, you don't own it. Repair connects people and devices to creating voice of present consumption. Self-repair is sustainable. Repair connects you with your things. Repair empowers and emboldens individuals. Repair transforms consumers into contributors. Repair inspires pride and ownership. Repair injects soul and makes things unique. Repair is independence. Repair requires creativity. Repair is clean. Repair is joyful. Repair is necessary for understanding our things. Repair saves money and resources. You have the right to open and repair our things without buying, without voiding the warranty. To devices that can be opened through the to air codes with wiring diagrams, to troubleshooting instructions and flow charts, to repair documentation for everything, to choose our own repair technicians, to remove do not renew stickers, to repair things in privacy by our parents, to replace any and all consumables ourselves, the hardware doesn't require proprietary tools to repair, to, avail to available responsible price service parts, to join the repair re revolution at iFixit.com. So that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening and logging off for now. I will see you out on the streets.